Welcome to EP Wealth Advisors Informed Investor Market Update for the week of June 21st. I'm Rob Black. I'm with EP Wealth. Joining me today, Adam Phillips, EP's Managing Director of Portfolio Strategy. The S&P 500 hit new highs 10 days ago, but spent a lot of last week losing a little bit of ground, pulling back, posting its worst weekly decline since February. Adam, can you run us through what happened on the S&P 500 um, last week and what's the the transition into the new week looking like? Sure. So, uh, you know, what we saw in the beginning of the week last week was the markets were pretty much range bound. They were were flat. And I, I think there was a lot of anticipation for the, the FOMC meeting, which took place on Tuesday, concluded on Wednesday of last week. And so following that meeting is really when we started to see the market um, uh, exhibit a little bit more excitement, shall we say. So it, it did close down. Um, uh, and uh, what, what we saw was really a, a shift back towards these growth names and, and this reversal of this so-called reflation trade that we've seen for several months now in which sectors like financials and energy were really the the star performers, we saw them actually uh, exhibit the most weakness and sell off quite a bit. And a lot of money went back into technology. So really, the actually, the only gainer last week was technology, up about 0.1%. And it was really just on, uh, on, on the, uh, as a result of this Fed meeting, which, which had a little bit more of a, uh, say, a, a hawkish tone, meaning that, um, you know, the, we, we, we got the, uh, what we, we, we got the notes from the Fed meeting and, and it appeared that there's many on the Fed who are talking about hiking earlier. They want to get ahead of this inflation. Some might feel that they are now behind the curve and, and feel like they need to uh, get control back before inflation gets away from us. And so I, what, what that did was it, it caused many people to kind of reevaluate that reflation trade. If the Fed is going to um, take those reins, then maybe that reflation trade doesn't have as much opportunity as people once thought. Which is more important to you with the Federal Reserve? Is it them saying we may stop buying back assets like um, bond debt to lower the cost of our mortgages? Or is it the interest rate, the 10-year treasury and how it kind of reacts to the Federal Reserve giving the stock market a little bit of uh, tailwind when rates are low, giving us a little bit of a headwind when rates are going higher? So again, which one do you think is more important for us to focus on? The, the debt purchases yeah. and or the interest rates and how the Fed controls those? Because it, it's, it, it's a loss. great question. It, yeah, great question. Without a doubt, I, I'd say it's the latter. Uh, you know, I, I don't really think that the, that the bond purchases are, are, it's significant. The amount is significant. And certainly last year when they put these on, uh, in on March 23rd, they came out, they said they're going to th- this QE infinity, and, and now they're buying 40 billion of mortgages a month, 80 billion of treasuries a month. That, that, that is not an insignificant amount. Um, but really, what we're really should be focused on is this is just part uh, what, what one part of current monetary policy, the next part is obviously um, uh, interest rate policy, and that's still uh, near zero. And, and we're talking about when they're going to actually start this lift off. And I think that is important. That's what people should really be focused on. That is what has a really big impact uh, on, um, on, on rates, on, on the markets, uh, and, and really um, policy um, either tightening or, uh, or uh, the, the looseness in monetary policy. I think that's what we should be focused on. It's interesting stuff, um, without a doubt. Let's take a look at some of the economic news that was reported last week. The economy clearly plays into the stock market. I think there was some important numbers on retail sales that you highlighted in your market commentary, as well as the initial unemployment claims. Sure. For an employee, we don't go shopping. There's kind of a link of the elbow to the uh, shoulder, uh, shoulder blade. They all kind of work together. But what economic news did you see last week that we should be focusing on? Yeah, there were a few. I'd say first is the retail sales number that we got for the month of May uh, showed uh, retail sales uh, down 1.3% for the month. You know, normally I, I think we would look at that and we would say, okay, we, we really, as an economy, we rely on the consumer. We, we rely on consumer spending. And so if we see a negative retail sales print, that might cause us to maybe take a step back and, and reassess. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of people were, were able to look through this number. I think number one is, is because we saw a, uh, uh, we, we saw the April number revised higher from uh, flat from 0% essentially to 0.9%. So we saw an upward revision there. And that took a little bit of the sting out of this main number. But I think the other thing is that retail sales is really focused on, on good spending. 
and we know that good spending is, is doing just fine. What we really need to look, look at right now is, uh, is service spending. You know, service spending is about two thirds of overall consumer spending, and it's not captured in this retail sales figure. Um, you know, that is really what took a hit. We think of the leisure and hospitality space, the, these areas that really took a hit during the pandemic, they are still underwater compared to where the, this number was before the pandemic. And so that's where we want to see, uh, see the growth. I, I think it's really important to focus our attention there. And so the retail sales, yeah, it, it was negative, but I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, we didn't see the market respond too much to that. So I, I think we're going to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the other one that we got uh, that, that, that you touched on was the uh, initial claims for unemployment. That number was, uh, I think it was about 412,000. So what was uh, probably more important than that number was the direction. You know, we have, we have seen several consecutive weeks of that number going, uh, trending downward. And it was actually uh, 375,000 the week before. So all of a sudden we see this surprise boost in the number of individuals filing for first time unemployment benefits. So that I, I think maybe caught a, lot, a few people uh, off guard. Um, and, you know, but, but I think this is, again, it's a weekly figure. So one number doesn't necessarily make a trend. I think it's just going to be important to watch going forward, but we do still, you know, we, we also look to the data that we got a couple weeks ago that we talked about uh, on, on our last recording. And that's the jolts number that showed that there were 9.3 million job openings in the U S. So there's obviously employers out there looking to hire. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm not going to get too concerned about this, uh, um, this slight jump in unemployment claims just yet. Putting this in real terms, I saw a report out this morning that June 1 through June 8th, vacations to Hawaii, they had about 2,000 more visitors this week of June 1 to June 8 than they did in 2019. So the demand is there for services, but in the same report, they're saying a lot of Hawaiian islanders left the island and came to the United States to look for work during the pandemic. And therefore, if you get a resort for $3,000 a night, it's still going to take an hour and a half to get a soda at the pool. Is that kind of what you're seeing in the labor market and the JOLTS report combining with services, pent up demand? And you don't even have to comment because I just, I think it's very antidotal, but it's fun to look at. It, it, it's amazing. I mean, we're, but we are getting those stories everywhere. You know, we're, we're reading about them. We're hearing, I, I was with my, uh, my parents yesterday for Father's Day. My dad was telling me how they went to their favorite Mexican restaurant in, in their area and, and they're friends with the owner now. They've been going for several years. And he said, you know, we had a great dinner, but the, the service, he said it was really, you could tell that uh, the owner was flustered because they couldn't figure anything out. And he said that everyone that's working there is now new and they are still understaffed. And he said, I'm trying to hire people and trying to pay them, a, you know, what I think is a decent wage and more than I used to, but people are hanging up on me. And, and he said, and we just can't get anyone, you know, for servers, for bartenders, anything like that. And it really tells you there's a mismatch between the, the supply and the demand in, uh, in the labor market right now. Um, and, and certainly plenty of people are, are anxious to get back out there and, uh, and, and visit restaurants and, and, and travel again. But hopefully there's people in, on the other side, uh, you know, of, uh, of the labor market. It's interesting because I'm hearing our economy is never going to be the same as it was in 2019. So there might be some adjustments we have to to uh, allow to play out in the coming months and years. Let's shift to policy a little bit. The bipartisan infrastructure bill, it could be one of Biden's key signature pieces of his term as president. It could be big. Will it have Democrat support? Will it have Republican support? How big will the price target be? How close are we, do you think, to the infrastructure bill that Biden wants to push forward? We're getting closer. I'd say we're still a ways away. Um, you know, where, where we stand is, uh, you know, with, with the bipartisan package, a little bit more than a trillion. So quite a bit less than what uh, the Biden administration was originally looking, uh, uh, looking at. Right. But uh, but what is important is, is that there's currently 21 senators on, on this bi of this bipartisan group uh, that uh, that are in favor of it, 11 of which are Republicans. So that's really important. Right. Because 10 is kind of that magic number of Republicans that, that they need. Uh, for, to get 60 votes in the Senate. Now that is assuming that all 50 Democrats vote in favor of it. And, and so that's not guaranteed either. So, um, but it is important that they do have the, uh, the support uh, from Republican senators, including Lindsey Graham, um, major, uh, I guess, notable Democrats like Joe Manchin, Kristen Sinema um, are in favor of it as well. Um, what, uh, what I read is that uh, Joe Biden over the weekend was going to look through uh, the details uh, of, of this proposal and, and, and come back. I, I think we know that he is not in favor of one of the 
uh, uh, one item in there, which is um, uh, it, it's increasing uh, or imposing a gas tax that, that's, uh, that tracks inflation. So he does not like that idea. Um, but that would really be the only one of the only increases in taxes in there. So it'd be really important. Um, so they have to come find a way to, to pay for this if they are going to do it. And so they are still a ways away, um, but I think it is important and, and it is helpful to just keep this uh, hopes of an infrastructure deal alive. The fact that uh, they, they are working across the aisle to try to get something done. And so um, hopefully they will come to some compromise in the not too distant future. Let's circle back to the Federal Reserve meeting last week. I want one more follow-up question with you on that because it just it seems to come up a lot in financial media. Um, Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve, was there anything at that meeting, we, we heard hints for the first time that they're going to start raising rates maybe 2023, twice, maybe 2022. A couple other members noted. Was there anything in there that, that caused you concern about the economy, about rates, about the timing? Um, anything else that we need to know from that meeting? I mean, there was plenty in, in that meeting, uh, right? I, I think the big takeaway is, is, is that the plane uh, is on the runway. It's not going to take off anytime soon. The plane being um, that the removal of, of uh, this accommodative policy. Um, there were no policy changes, but they're talking. I, I think Jerome Powell really said it best when he said this was the uh, talking about talking about meeting. And what he was referring to there is several months ago, he said, we're not even thinking about thinking about um, raising rates uh, or, or stopping bond purchases. And, and, and so it really gets to that. They are starting to talk about it, but they're still a ways away. Okay. And, and so, um, but, but what this did tell us is that there are some within the, uh, within the, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee that are uh, starting to think that there will come a time when they do need to raise rates and it might come a little bit sooner than they uh, previously anticipated. So what we saw is that seven of the 18 uh, um, members who, who provide these, uh, these projections that, that make up this so-called dot plot of where interest rate policy is going to be at the end of, of uh, each of the next few years, seven of the 18 of them see a rate hike, the first rate hike as early as the end of 2022. Um, versus the last time this was done back in March, there were only four. And so that tells you people are, are bringing forward their expectations of the first rate hike. Um, but the median dot plot uh, is, is still showing two, uh, two rate hikes by the end of 2023. Um, so that's um, certainly been, been brought forward too. But I think, you know, the reality is that, that you know, the, the Jay Powell and others on the Fed are, are quick to remind people, look, these are these are, are just projections. Things can change between now and then. And, and so don't read too much into it. But I think it's just helpful to see what, what everyone is thinking and, and how they are interpreting current things like inflationary data. Um, and, and it kind of just gives us a glimpse in, into their world and into their brain to see how they're uh, digesting everything. So I think it's interesting. We certainly saw the market respond, but um, you know, not, nothing, you know, I, 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 I'd say that there's still... Um, we are still in, in a really critical phase of this, of this reopening where it's still too early for them to decide. And I think what they did was they bought themselves some time and they said that they're paying attention essentially. And, and you're, they're, what they're trying to do is walk a tightrope because obviously there's people out there who say they are behind the curve and there's people who saw this report and the way that the market responded and said, okay, maybe they just overcorrected and, and, and tried to and maybe went a step too far and saying that they're willing to uh, could be willing to raise rates twice by the end of 2023. And maybe that's too much. So they're not going to please everybody, but I think it's important to show that they are paying attention. I think they did that. I've got an economist friend who very loudly claims that the Federal Reserve has caused every major recession in the United States history by either acting too quickly or acting too late. It's a heated topic and we'll talk about it in the future. Let's end on the note, Adam, of anything looking uh, that you're going to be looking out for this week when you're away from your desk that you want to be at your desk as far as economic releases. I don't think we have any big earnings. Um, what are you going to be watching for as far as new data this week? You know, this is, uh, you know, th th there's a few things this week and we're going to get some uh, data on, on housing. So existing home sales tomorrow, as well as new home sales on Wednesday. But really, I, I think that, there's a couple things that are probably more important than that. Um, this week, there's nine uh, members of the Fed who are speaking. Um, a couple of them have already spoken this morning. Uh, Jay Powell is, is uh, uh, testifying before Congress tomorrow. And really why that's important is, is coming off of this Fed, uh, this FOMC meeting from last week, this is going to be the chance for some of them to clarify their positions and, and maybe 
um, maybe expand upon what we saw in the dot plots. Uh, they can provide words around that and that may help alleviate concerns or might actually cr uh, create uh, additional concerns around the future of Fed policy. So I think that's what a lot of people are going to be focused on. You know, the other big one is, uh, is coming on, on Friday and that's the, the release of uh, inflation data. We know inflation is top of mind right now. So, one of, uh, so we're looking at uh, the PCE deflator, uh, which is the Fed's preferred uh, measure of inflation. Uh, so we're looking at PCE, which is a total uh, number for the, the basket of, uh, of, of goods, um, as well as core PCE, which is, just strips out food and energy prices. Both of those are expected to climb uh, about half a percent over the previous month. And so I, I think it'll be really interesting if those come in uh, and, and actually overshoot the, uh, the current estimate, then you know, we could see the market respond. Uh, just knowing how sensitive people are to inflation today. Uh, but the other piece that, that comes out with that report is uh, overall personal consumption. And that, that figure, relative to the retail sales figure that we got last week, I, I would say it's a broader measure of, uh, of, of consumption, just because it does include uh, things like services, which I mentioned, comprises a huge part of, of overall consumption. So I think this report on Friday is going to be really big and tell us a lot about how the economy is doing. Um, so uh, that's what I'll be focused on. And that's what we'll be talking about next week. Thanks for joining me, Adam. It's Adam Phillips, EP Managing Director of Portfolio Strategy. I'm Rob Black with EP Wealth Advisors Informed Investor Market Update. Good day.